The story you were about to hear is true. Attention, all true. She's alive. Alive! Welcome to the Retrolist. As soon as I got my driver's license and had access to my first car, which wasn't my car, it was the family's car, I started to push the limits as to how far I could go with that car. This could be tricky because at first, when I was given the car, it was usually just to run errands. But eventually, I proved that I could drive the car well enough that I was given the car to go do other things. Go to the mall for myself, go to an arcade, that sort of stuff. But no matter how far I got from my house, I always wanted to go just a little bit further. My family had taken road trips when I was younger. We had gone as far north as Canada and as far south as Florida. And while I was not driving during that time period, I enjoyed the idea of exploration and the open road tremendously. So it was only a matter of time before I decided to take my newfound driving privileges and risk them and the trust of my family to take the car myself on a road trip. I saved up money for a bit, then one weekend I asked if I could go to the mall with the car, which if my family didn't need the car all day could be a very long affair, although I was told I had to check in. And I drove down to the far end of New Jersey, a town called Cape May. I had no goal in mind. I just wanted to be out there. And I loved the freedom. Now, I wouldn't call the New Jersey Turnpike or Garden State Parkway in New Jersey big open roads. But to me, they felt like limitless blacktop. And driving down the shore, as we called it, was one of the greatest feelings of my teen years. I also felt tremendously guilty, and when I got home, I told my mother what I had done, figured I would get punished. She asked me why I had done it, and I said, because it's something I've always wanted to do. She sort of smiled, and no punishment came. I would later find out that she had done very similar things when she was young, and I guess she thought, who was she to judge someone who was just trying to live their teen dreams? I've always been infatuated with driving and the open road. I don't care what kind of vehicle it is, I just like being out there. And this is not something that's faded over the years, I still enjoy driving a lot. Maybe not so much in city driving, but get me out on a highway, no traffic, and the tension just melts away. Lucky for me, there were a lot of movies that had to do with the open road, usually involving chases and law enforcement, things I never really tangled with. Movies like Smokey and the Bandit and The Cannonball Run were at the top of my list. Lighthearted, fun yet deeply entwined with the promise of the open road. On today's show, I'm going to talk about one of those movies. We're going to talk about the Cannonball Run. We'll talk about the people behind and in front of the camera, talk a little bit about the characters they played, talk about its reception, its sequels, and we'll throw in a few surprises here and there. We have an info-packed episode ahead of us, so without further ado, let's start the show. The Cannonball Run is a 1981 comedy. It stars Dom DeLuise, Burt Reynolds, and Farrah Fawcett, and a very big supporting cast. It was directed by Hal Needham and was produced by Hong Kong's Golden Harvest Films. Golden Harvest is a Hong Kong-based production, distribution, and exhibition company, and in the 1970s and 80s, they ruled the Hong Kong box office and introduced the world to a lot of great Hong Kong films. Without Golden Harvest, I'm not so sure that Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan would be such household names. The movie itself was based on an actual race, and it is called the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash, or Cannonball Run. And it started in the 70s and would be run for five years. It would start in Darien, Connecticut, 
which is on the east coast of the United States, and it would end on the west coast at the Portofino Inn in Redondo Beach, which is outside of Los Angeles. The idea for the race came out of the mind of car magazine writer and racer Brock Yates and editor of Car and Driver Steve Smith. They started it when the new 55 mile an hour speed limit was imposed on the United States by the National Maximum Speed Law, and they found out that that was actually slower than the quickest of speeds point to point by Erwin George Cannonball Baker, who in 1933 drove coast to coast in 53 hours and 30 minutes, setting a record that would stand for nearly 40 years. The first Cannonball run was run on May 3rd, 1971, and it really wasn't a race. It was just sort of a celebration. One vehicle, it had Yates, his son, Steve Smith, and a friend named Jim Williams, riding a 1971 Dodge Custom Sportsman van across the country. The race would run four more times after that, and a lot of those races and the people who competed in it would become the inspiration for characters in the Cannonball Run movie. They started to publish stories about the Cannonball Run in Car and Driver magazine, and these were sort of lighthearted, and they weren't sure how they would be received, but people really seemed to like the idea of it. It captured the imagination. And then in 1975, they ran an article in Time magazine about it, and things blew up. People started to get really excited about the Cannonball Run races, and it would only be a matter of time before these things would be translated into film. There were two movies made before the Cannonball Run, one just called Cannonball, and the other called The Gumball Rally. Brock Yates, creator and participant in the Cannonball Run, is a best-selling author, started writing when he was 16 years old. He had started working on a screenplay for Cannonball Run, but other people had gotten those two movies in the 70s out pretty quickly. He had worked with director stuntman Hal Needham on the movie Smokey and the Bandit 2. They had a pretty good relationship, had participated in one of the Cannonball Runs together, and decided that they would collaborate on a Cannonball Run movie together. So the director of the movie is Hal Needham. Hal Brett Needham was born in 1931, and he passed away in 2013. He was a stuntman. Probably his first big break was as the stunt double for Richard Boone on the TV show Have Gun, Will Travel. But he would work as a stuntman on a lot of stuff before becoming a director. His big break was probably Smokey and the Bandit, which starred his good friend Burt Reynolds. He would follow that up with a couple of other great movies from that time, including The Cannonball Run, Hooper, Stroke Race, and Rad. This movie, when it was written, was going to be pure action. Probably a little comedy in there. And it was to star Steve McQueen. Sadly, Steve McQueen was diagnosed with cancer when they were going to start making the film, and they offered the part to Burt Reynolds, and the movie morphed into more of a general comedy. Filming was done in a mind-boggling 36 days, really fast. Some of these people only worked together for a few hours, and Burt Reynolds would receive a $5 million paycheck for his three weeks of work on the film. While the filming was quick, it wasn't without its problems. There was a lot of stunt driving in the film, and someone was unfortunately injured. Stunt woman Heidi Von Belts became a paraplegic when the car she was in lost control and crashed. Today's show is brought to you by your local auto repair shop. Going to enter the Cannonball Run? Make sure you get yourself checked out at your local auto repair shop. It's tune-up time for your automobile to keep it performing strong. You'll like the sound of a tune motor as you go humming along. Love those auto repair shops. 
the plot of the Cannonball Run involves an illegal race across country with multiple participants, and we'll talk a little bit about the main participants in a moment. But the idea is you have to move from the East Coast to the West Coast as fast as you can. If you get a ticket, you got to pay for it out of your own pocket. If you get arrested, that's your problem. But you're not going to win the race by going 55 miles an hour. So everyone involved in the race going into it knows they have to break the law to win. Reckless driving. Disorderly conduct. Oh, give me somebody. And destruction of public property. These are the tricks of the trade in the Cannonball Run. Starring Burt Reynolds, Roger Moore, Sarah Fawcett, Don DeLuise, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr. You'll root for them all, but you'll never guess who wins. The Cannonball Run. Rated PG. Starts Friday at a selected theater near you. The main characters in the film are J.J. McClure, played by Burt Reynolds. He and his sidekick, Victor, played by Dom DeLuise, drive a souped-up ambulance. And the ambulance they use was actually the ambulance that Hal Needham and Brock Yates used when they raced in the real cannonball run. Needham and Yates didn't win the cannonball run. They blew their transmission, and they're sort of a reference to the transmission problems in the movie. After the movie, the ambulance would be donated to a church charity, which auctioned it off to raise money. Burt Leon Reynolds Jr. was born in 1936. He's an American actor, director, probably best known for his work in Smokey and the Bandit and Deliverance. Dom DeLuise, who played Victor and Captain Chaos, and that's something you should know about the character. He has a split personality. One of them is this timid fellow. The other one is a superhero, Captain Chaos, who can do amazing things, and he does turn into him several Several times in the movie. As a kid, that was some of the best parts. Dom DeLuise was born in 1933. He passed away in 2009. Actor, comedian, director, producer, chef, author, funny guy. Probably best known for his work in History of the World, Blazing Saddles. He was also in a great movie called Fatso, which has traditionally been a little difficult to get your hands on. But if you dig, you can find a copy. Really worth checking out. Now, these two had their ambulance, but they needed a doctor and patient to make it convincing. Their patient was Farrah Fawcett, who played Pamela Glover, or as she was nicknamed, Beauty. Farrah Fawcett, actress and artist, passed away in 2009, born in 1947. Probably best known for her iconic poster, which sold over 20 million copies. She was also Jill Monroe in the first season of Charlie's Angels. The Doctor, Dr. Nicholas Van Helsing, was played by Jack Ellum. Ellum, who passed away in 2003, was a wide-eyed character actor, probably best known for playing villains. He appeared in 73 movies, 41 episodes of television, probably best known for his work in High Noon, The Twilight Zone, and Once Upon a Time in the West. Now, this movie is packed with other stars. To go through all of them would probably take an hour. But because it has such a big cast, it has a sort of mad, 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 mad world quality to it. And up until this movie started being shown on cable television, I watched that movie, It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World, all the time when it was on. And then The Cannonball Run became my new version of that movie to watch because it has a lot of great celebrities. It has probably, most notably... Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. playing priests driving cross-country. Sammy Davis Jr. almost didn't get the role. It was originally written for Don Rickles, who backed out, and Sammy Davis Jr. did a great job with the role. Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buckman are the women in the Lamborghini who use sex appeal as they drive across country to get out of tickets. Jackie Chan is in this film, playing Mitsubishi Driver 1, although he's really playing himself. He's being interviewed on a talk show at the beginning, and they do mention him by name as Jackie Chan. Jamie Farr from MASH plays Sheikh Abdul Ben Falafel. Burt Comby is in this film. I think it's his last motion picture that he did. Terry Bradshaw and Mel Tillis play a pair of good old boys who drink their way across America. The chemistry between those two was so good that ABC was going to do a spin-off series about their characters as a TV show, but the head of the network was fired before the project could get a green light. Roger Moore, in a very meta appearance, plays Seymour Goldfarb Jr., who is Roger Moore, who lives a lot like James Bond, including driving his silver Aston Martin across the country, with at every turn a new woman as his co-pilot. All the women had their voices dubbed 
by voice artist June Foray. For some reason, they didn't want to use these women's real voice. And that's okay, because June Foray is great. You might know her as the voice of Rocket J. Squirrel and Natasha on Bullwinkle. In fact, if you listen to one of the voices, I swear it sounds a lot like Natasha. Rounding out the cast, you had Peter Fonda, who gets into a fight with Jackie Chan. Alfie Wise, 